Leslie Brown, also known as Downtown Leslie Brown, if you want to find me on anything social media. Um, Self-proclaimed tech geek, um, brain enthusiast, uh, I work at Pluralsight. We're just going to jump in and I'm really sorry that, about the delay. Okay, actually, so I'm going to hit you with my idea for the, the main point of this first which is we have a limited amount of decision-making power or resources every day. I'm going to take you a step back as to why this has been on my mind lately. So I recently went two months without having any solids. I had to be on a liquid diet. This was medical reasons. This was not my choice. And it was an interesting experience and I noticed that I was, I was kind of relaxed about it. People kind of reacted with this horror because so people notice when you are only having super smoothies, people notice and so people start asking. And there's only so many times you can just say no thanks to any kind of food ever. So people would ask me, why aren't you eating? I would explain, I'm on a liquid diet. And they would respond with this horror, and I would say, it's actually not that bad. It's kind of relaxing, and nobody bought this. Everyone kind of reacted, is this, is the mic weird? Okay. So everyone kind of reacted, just confused, mostly horror, like, that must be so awful. And and I was, I was trying to explain, like, really, it's kind of awesome. And, and so they, they would be confused and I would try to explain. And so I would set them up with this scenario. And this is the best I could come to a, an explanation even though it really didn't cut it. So any, any point in time I really had about three options of, of what to eat. And I would be at my desk and people around me, the lunch conversations would start. I'm getting hungry, who wants to go to lunch? Where do you want to go? Are you hungry now? Do you want to eat later? Are you hungry enough? Do you want to get sushi? We got sushi last time. And they would turn to me and say, Leslie, do you want to come with us? And I would say, well, I got hungry like four minutes ago. So like two minutes ago, I got this protein shake and I'm, I'm all set. And that did not sound like a good enough trade-off still. So people were like, that doesn't sound relaxing. That, does, that just sounds awful. And so, so I didn't go into the explanation of like, well, we have a limited amount of cognitive resources every day, and I have freed up this crazy amount with not deciding what to eat. So this idea wasn't new to me, but it was shocking how relaxing it was, how awesome it was how many extra resources I had just from not picking food anymore. So there are some kind of famous examples of this. A not really famous example is this guy. Oh, you really can't see. You can kind of see. This is Dr. Cerf. He's a neuroscientist who studies decision making, and he has implemented this rule. When he goes to a restaurant, he picks item number two on the specials no matter what. This does not always work out well for him, but it is a decision he made and he sticks with it because he wants to save his decision-making powers for better, big, more important things. We have other examples of kind of like hacks like this, like shortcuts of people who are, they want to take out a routine decision that they're making every day because they want to make, they want to focus those resources on better, bigger decisions. So we have Einstein who famously bought like 10 of the same soup, all gray, like kind of, kind of different. We have Jobs, who wore his turtleneck we all know about, Zuckerberg, regular old t-shirt we all know about, and then there's Obama, who was a little bit different, because he did have slightly different renditions, but we didn't really notice how much he wears this thing until the time that he didn't wear that thing, and there were reactions to that. It was a big deal. So what I'm really talking about today is not decision making per se, I'm talking about self-regulation, which is obviously a much cooler title and it would have gotten a bigger audience. So I want to define self-regulation first before we move forward. 
Self-regulation, we really kind of have two systems in the brain. And if, is anybody familiar with thinking fast and slow? Daniel Kahneman? We got a nod, okay. So we kind of have two systems. We have automatic system, like there is no stopping that, that always has thoughts, that always has impulses. And then there's, there's the effortful control, there's your self-regulation. Anything you are deciding, you're deciding, I'm not looking at that inappropriate thing, I'm looking at the appropriate thing. I'm not looking at the distraction, I'm focusing on the thing I wanna focus on. I'm having the healthy item, not the not healthy item. Anything your brain does that you rely on to function in life is your self-regulation. So, moving forward, this doesn't matter that much, but people like to know where it is in the brain. This lives here, prefrontal dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. I'm not really super sure why I'm telling you this, but be careful and honor and value that part of your brain. Don't hit it, massage it at night or something. And I, and I will come back to this a little bit later. But I want to give you a little bit of the backstory about how we came to our current state of knowledge about this thing, this topic. So backstory, we started focusing mostly on self-control, and that's where the that's where the research starts. But we have we have these three models, and it's interesting that we went so long thinking that this way about our cognitive resources. And I'm, and I'm going to use decision making as the example. So there are three models that we weren't really sure about. First model, skill, decision making as a skill. So this would suggest that like throughout the day, we're going to make equally good decisions no matter what. It's something you can kind of get better at over time, but you're pretty much, it's a skill you can rely on. It's like speaking another language. You can pretty much reliably like speak at the same level of that speaking anytime. And there's model number two. So it's like a knowledge structure. So this was the idea that we had this kind of set algorithms that we just had on standby all the time and we could call on them whenever we wanted to. So this would also say, suggest that the skill doesn't degrade, you're gonna make the same level of decisions all throughout the day. And there's this third model, which we all know now, it's like as a strength or as an energy. You can run out, you can deplete, there's a time of the day that you have the most, there's a time of the day you have the least. So then we move forward and we start out with studies that are very focused on self-control because somebody somewhere goes, I think we might have a limited amount of self-control in the day. And so this was novel and exciting and so I'm gonna set up some of these studies because I, I think it's really important to kind of show what has brought us to the current state of the knowledge about this. So we start out with really just traditional like cookies and radishes, not that, radishes themselves are traditional, but the idea of a temptation of a food, something we all deal with every day. So we have like group one, we have the foods out, radishes and freshly baked cookies. And you tell them, please eat these radishes. You cannot eat anything that's not assigned to you. Please eat these radishes. We have group two, and laid out before you are these freshly baked cookies and M&Ms. Please pick one, only eat the one that you pick. After this, we take them into a task, and this is how all of them work. We, we take you into a task, and the idea is, if, it's, if you have a task that requires self-regulation and you start using up some cognitive resources, we're gonna see a decline performance in the second task. So you are not good at the second task. You guys are great at the second task. The radish people are struggling in the second task, and they start out with things like, how long can you keep your hand in freezing cold water? Because the idea is if you have good self-control, you're gonna hold it in there longer. So they do this with other things like, you group do not think about white elephant, you group two, you are allowed to think about white elephant. And even this has, um, has a measurable effect and is statistically significant on the second task. And they start, they start doing different kinds of, of, of second tasks. They move on to 
hold this grip, grip this thing as, as long as you can, and then they move on to do these problem solving things. Do them as long as you can. Have this gross drink and drink as much as you can, but stop when you just absolutely can't anymore. So the third one, which I think is one, one of the most interesting ones, is they had groups watch sad and funny movies. You group, you are not allowed to have any responses. You have to be stoic. We're gonna we're gonna record all of your responses. You watch these movies. We're not gonna make you. We're not gonna make you try to change your responses, but we're still gonna record you. Just enjoy the movie. You are horrible at the next task. And this one was interesting. This is like they did these really mean kind of tasks, like like actually undoable tasks, like tracing, but you can't trace. You can't go over the same line, and you can't pick up the pencil. Um, so, so they don't they don't know that they actually can't do the task. But you guys give up early. You're frustrated. You guys do great on it. You don't love the task, but you keep doing it, and you do pretty well. The the one, the next one, the memorizing numbers, is interesting. And if, are any of you familiar with Kathy Sierra's talk? The, I'm sure the badass user. No, okay. So she, anyway, she mentions this specific study, and this one's mentioned a lot. So this group, you have to memorize seven numbers. This group, you have to memorize two numbers. After this, they give them cake and fruit. They say, pick whichever you want. You guys pick fruit, and you guys pick cake. So we're starting to see these interesting um, Self-control is down, like you're, you're picking more short-term rather than long-term. And, and this, this goes on. I'm, I'm not going to talk about the frustrating task. Oh, wait. Yes, I am. That's important. The frustrating task. So they realize all they have to do is really kind of frustrate people in the first one, in the first task. And they make them, they make, it's just a frustrating task, like, the easy group, you just cross off all the E's. This group, we give you really bad copy of something. You can't really read it very well. Only cross off the E's if there's a certain amount of syllables, if it's not next to a vowel, and it has X amount of consonants, and you're frustrated. So what they, what they noticed in this one, because they found that some people were getting more passive after. They're, they're, they were trying to like start decision ducking. They didn't want to make decisions. So in the second task, they had them watch a really, really, really boring movie. Not like a movie that's out in movie theaters. They made a movie of like looking at a corner and like looking at a shelf. And the, the ones who had done the frustrating task became really passive and they just sat through it. Even though it was depleting their resources. And they could have been like, no, I'm frustrated. I don't want to do this anymore. They sat and they watched this boring movie. This has implications for boring meetings. I want you guys to know for later. So then, so the lab that's studying this, they have this postdoc student who, not student, postdoc. She's getting married and she's going through all of the registration decisions. And she describes this to the lab. And she says at the end, I was so tired, you could have convinced me to do anything. And so they start to think about this idea of decision making, not just, not just self-control. Maybe, self, maybe decision making is coming from the same like, pool of resources. So they kind of set up a similar, they kind of had like you group, you're kind of doing your own registry. And then they had this group kind of just look at these things and make preferences and opinions. But you guys have to pick stuff. So we see the same thing. You guys are, your cognitive resources are declining. They do the, the next one with Dell computers, and I think this one's really interesting because the only difference in the two groups, they were assigned different tasks of you have to pick out all these different things that you would get online. The only difference in this group, you had to actually pick what you would do. So they wanted to get, they wanted to see what part of the decision making 
really drains the resource? Is it the analysis? Is it the trade-off? It's not the trade-off that does take some, some cognitive resources, but it is the picking. It is the saying, I pick this one, I like, I pick this one and I'm gonna see what the results are. That's the biggest drain, which I think is super interesting. And they did that with a couple other things. Then, this one, the last one I wanna talk about, they did not, it was, this wasn't a study they did. They found this research, somebody watched a parole board in 1,100 parole hearings. So they, they have a group of people and everyone's bringing their case to them and they're saying we grant you parole, we don't. And they watched it over a course of several days and they notice all, everyone who gets parole, it's early in the morning. As they go throughout the day, they're having decision fatigue or ego depletion or whatever you want to call it, but their cognitive resources are draining and they don't want to take the risk. So, and they even compared this to people who had the same crime, so we're dealing with the exact same situations. You were more likely to get parole if you were early in the morning or right after lunch. So that matters, food matters. So what we know from all of this is self-regulation is a pool of resources. It's not that skill, it's not that set of knowledge, it's not that knowledge structure. So the pool, what is in the pool? Basically everything you need in life to work, focus, persistence, self-control, emotion suppression, that comes from the movies, problem solving, frustration tolerance, and some memory. Not the things you just remember because it's random, but those the memory, like I have to remember what this button does, I have to remember the two digits, the seven digits. What depletes the pool? Basically all of this stuff. So what's interesting right now is that everything in, in our day, when, when we're not thinking about these things, everything, every decision that's put in front of us, it's kind of first come, first serve. However many cognitive resources you have at that moment, that's how many the, that decision gets. So we're, it's kind of, if you don't know that this is happening, then you may not be designating the amount of cognitive resources to the decisions you want to be making. So what happens when this is depleted? Now I want to go back to this uh, strength model. So when we have physical strength, it's very easy to tell we have a really great gauge on how much physical strength we have or how tired we are in a day. When you're doing reps and bicep curls, it's really clear. You're doing great and then you're getting tired and then you're running out. This is not the case for cognitive resources and we have no good gauge for how many we have during the day. We're not, we're not going to the candy wall and picking something good and some, over something bad or the other way around and then having like points marked off. We don't know. And we own, the closest thing we have to an actual good gauge on how we are and how, our, how full our pool is, is we start to experience other things in a heightened way. Things that are frustrating become more frustrating. Things that are annoying are more annoying. Things that are tempting are more tempting. And that's not clear and obvious. And unless you're looking for those things, not going to be checking in on those things to see how your pool of resources is doing. This is an interesting case study. This guy, we're not talking about depleted resources here. We are talking about a guy in 1858 who damaged his, his uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. He, before the accident, super nice guy, super polite, really good at planning and executing. After Rude, says whatever comes to his mind, not polite, and he makes plans, but he cannot execute on the plans. He makes big elaborate plans, starts on the plan, and then gets distracted and doesn't want to do it anymore, does something else. So he's an interesting case study of what happens if you get a bar that goes straight through there. So this is, this is an interesting thing. What replenishes this? 
let me ask you, what do you guys think might replenish the pool? Sleep. Sleep, I'm hearing sleep. What else? Meditation. Oh, good. Meditation, anything else? Relaxation. Relaxation. Hmm? Movement. Movement. Distraction. Distraction. Caffeine. What did I miss? Caffeine. Caffeine, I wish. <laughs> um, so researchers started out like totally sure it's going to be having fun. <laughs> and they had this really elaborate study, like, I'm going to tax your, your cognitive resources, and then I'm going to let you guys have a lot of fun. That did not do the trick. Sleep, I think we've, there's never been a study that like has a person go take a nap, and then they test them again. But we start every day with like the most amount of cognitive resources. So we're, we're going to assume that it's sleep, but there's not a study that says that for sure. What they found was food was a big deal, and they thought, along with the maybe it's fun, maybe if it's really tasty. So they started out and they gave one group a really delicious shake, and they gave another troop really kind of gross glop, and that's even how they explained it. In the, it's weird. But everybody, people in both groups, came out and performed. They both regained their replenished resources at the same rate. So the other thing, some research suggests that meditation helps with, helps with self-regulation. There are not exactly studies that are looking exactly at this, but the, the preliminary evidence is really strong for, for mindfulness meditation specifically. So before I go into the takeaways, I want to circle back to this idea that we don't have a good gauge. And right now everything is kind of first come, first serve. I do want to recap what some others have said, some, some big minds in our field. Kathy Sierra, when she's talking about cognitive resources, she emphasizes and puts a lot of weight on the value of defaults. Let's just have the default be the thing that would help the user become a badass user. She also puts emphasis on not making the user have to remember things. Don't make them remember what that button is, have the button say what it is. So we're not taxing people on what they have to remember. Uh, Daniel Kahneman, he has a lot of emphasis on routines. Make a routine so you're not having to decide as you go through every day, like kind of easy, not easy, but you're just trying to take out a bunch of the decisions every day. So you are focusing on the hard decisions and not the like, what do I do next decision. He also has kind of, like, he, he has one sentence to this, and, and I think it's like huge and important, and I wish he had more sentences. He says kind of sarcastically, like, I also think it's super surprising that our leaders aren't trained in running more effective meetings. I would give that like, a raise the roof. I think everyone should have better and more effective meetings because we are not thinking about how many cognitive resources we might be draining when we ask a group to sit through something that either isn't relevant to them or if they need to work through something. If they have like a big problem they're working through, maybe the meeting can be put off. I don't think we're thinking through how, what we're asking of people just to sit down. They have to go actually through a lot to inhibit all their impulses as they're sitting there. So designers, I would say, be aware of what you're asking of your user. Are you asking them to persist through something? If you are, maybe don't have anything that's distracting their attention. Are you asking them to make a lot of decisions? Can, if so, can you make it like three options? That's the, that's the answer McKinsey has come to. When their people are talking to their clients, they give them three options. They do not give them a wealth of a ton of options. Everyone, just day to day, I would say my hard, hard rule, if you have a decision and you need a decision ducker to make the decision at your work, bring them a bowl of Cheerios in the morning. As soon as they're done with the Cheerios, start asking your question. 
unless the decision you want them to make is a temptation, in which case you want to ask them that question at the end of the day, right before dinner. Other things. Just be conscious when you have something that you want to prioritize over something else, make sure you're, when you are attacking that, when you have more cognitive resources, I would recommend. Also, if you don't want to be the person who wears one outfit all the time, maybe pick your outfit at the end of the day for the next day. I respect your decision either way. Leaders, be conscious of what you're asking of your group. If it's meetings, if you have a really annoying person on the team, please know that everyone is having to suppress their emotion around that person. I'm kidding. But do be aware of what you're asking of your team. Um, and little things like the emphasis on pre-planning, kind of like don't put candy out on your, t on your desk if somebody's on a diet. Also, I'm not going to say run out and go on a diet because that's a tricky one because I just had no options. Like I had temptation, but the, the retribution was way worse. So I'm not going to say going on a diet is the answer, but if you do, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that says the people who have the most cognitive resources are the most disciplined. They don't sit and decide, am I going to work out today? Should I, should I not, but I'm really tired. They work out, they work out every morning. They have some kind of pre-plan, it's all set, and they're, they're really disciplined with it. Mike, that's it, do we have any questions? Is it, when we talk about being like a strength, is it something if you practice making decisions, you can strength and kind of get better at making decisions? That's a great question. So the closest we've seen to anything that would allow that to happen is meditation. Because what mindfulness meditation is, is you're trying to become aware of your thoughts and direct it to something for, for a long period of time. So basically you're strengthening that function of where is my intention going, so you're, and you're becoming more mindful of where your actual cognitive resources are going. What am I thinking about? Do I want to be thinking about that? No, that's kind of a destructive thought. I'm going to focus on this other thing. So it's the closest thing that we have to anything other, other than maybe eating all day, which I recommend. <laughs> Yes, there's, there's a great book, it's How We Decide. Thinking Fast and Slow is probably the newest. The, um, the really interesting one that, that talks about, about <laughs> the dis decision fatigue from having too many options is, Paradox of Choice, that's a good one. Also, there's, what's interesting and not said a lot is we actually don't know a lot about this. Like, we've unearthed some really interesting questions like food, food helps. So what are the good foods? I mean, anecdotally, people are like, well, the good healthy foods, not the candy, but nobody's really tested that. What we also don't know, the only thing we know that like will take your, take more cognitive resources than another, is that one study that, te that tested the difference between looking at preferences and, and making decisions. We have no idea beyond that what takes more cognitive resources than other things. Like this would be a really important thing to study, but what gets a lot of the funding in this circle of academics is how do you get people to buy stuff? Like at what point are they like cognitively drained and you're gonna get them to buy stuff? That's where really good, interesting research is happening and there's a lot of money there, um, but that's kind of unfortunate as well. Yeah, so I studied cognitive neuroscience. Um, 
and actually stumbling into a book about Phineas Gage, that case study when I was like 12, was something that made me decide that I wanted to do that. Um, the plan was to be, to be a researcher. I don't have the patience for that kind of research. I still love reading the research. I can't do the research, but that's my background. It, it is, and it's a particularly interesting case because it's something that asks like a lot in terms of cognitive resources of the user. We're teaching, so you're, we're asking a lot of people, and you know. So we also have to be really careful about how much we're asking, and are we fatiguing them, and are we asking the right, are we asking the right things of them? So it's an, it's an interesting case. we rely more on our cognitive biases, um, which are not necessarily bad. Um, they're, they're the shortcuts, they're the hacks that we've developed over time. Um, I mean, we don't want to be, we don't want to be stuck in like some cost bias, that's, that's not a good one, and a lot of them are not good ones, but we do, we are a little bit more vulnerable to them, but we rely on them later. that it takes more cognitive research. Well, because it is, it's self-control, it's effortful. So, I mean, doing something that's hard for you is going to be more draining. We do know that. Um, so somebody more introverted who has to speak in front of a group or something, that would be more draining for one person than maybe somebody who is extroverted. That's a good question. Okay, what, what have we covered so far? There's, Kathy Sierra covers it a little bit. Um, the paradox of choice talks about decision fatigue. That's super interesting. How we decide is a really great book. And Thinking Fast and Slow, those are, those are really good books. It, but if you want to stay on top of like research that's coming out, you're really going to look at like, it's going to be marketing. That's where the money is. All right, thanks everybody.